if you would have told me when I was a practicing occupational therapist that I would eventually become a lawyer and then a judge, I would have said to you, really? Why would anyone in the healing arts want to practice law? That transformation occurred in the strangest of places. It was a convalescent home. I was filling in for a fellow therapist, and she had been caring for an elderly man who had recently had a stroke. As I was doing notes in my small office that afternoon, I overheard the elderly man crying, so I began to listen. And what I heard was his home caretaker was threatening him that she was not going to feed his dog unless he gave her power of attorney. That really distressed me because I knew that his wife had recently passed away and all he had in the world was that little dog. I was irate, so I marched down to the director's office. I wanted justice, and I told him about what he had heard. Do you know what he said to me? Mind your own business. Mind my own business? I'm trying to help this man. I didn't know what to do, so I started calling lawyers, one after another, to see if I could find anybody who was interested, and I was not able to. So in a quandary, I thought, what about the local law school? I called and was fortunate to be put uh, in contact with a professor who specialized in advocacy for the elderly. He agreed to meet me the next day. During our conversation, he agreed that the elderly man did need representation, and he linked me with an omnibusman to provide that. As our conversation was winding down, he suddenly looked at me and he said, if you do well on the entrance exam, I guarantee you admission to law school. And I was like, what? <laughs> me? A lawyer? I don't think so. But the more I tried to get rid of that idea, the more I thought about it. And what I realized was that compassion and the law could be practiced together, because that is exactly what enabled me to help the elder, elderly man who so desperately needed assistance. So I took the exam, I went to law school, I passed the bar, and I started working in the district attorney's office protecting victims of domestic violence. And then I went on the bench. I was so excited because this was an opportunity to combine my former profession with care and compassion with my knowledge of the law. My first day on the job was Monday. The possibilities were endless. But by Friday, five days on the job, I realized that my new job had nothing to do with compassion and everything to do with processing paperwork. <laughs> because you see, the criminal justice then and still today is very much like a factory. The cases go down the assembly line and everyone does their part. Peace officer arrests the individual, district attorney files the case, the lawyers get together with the judge, they craft a sentence, and probation then comes in and oversees it. And everybody does that with this idea that this human being is going to reoffend. And in fact, 75% of prisoners released from state prison reoffend within the first 18 months. And therein starts this revolving door of jails and prisons. There are so many people that pass through my court that suffer from mental illness, substance abuse, and homelessness, and often all three. Is prison really the place to help people get better? About four months into my job, I became even more discouraged. This was because I had decided to implement in my courtroom a positive reinforcement approach. I tried to convince my clients that they could accomplish anything they set their mind to. And I was very surprised when they started picking up new cases within just a few weeks. What was I doing wrong? I knew that when I spoke to them, they wanted a better life. And I knew that when I treated them with dignity and respect, they responded well to that. What was my mistake? 
I was soon to find out. I attended a judge's conference that spring, and that's where I learned about collaborative courts. Former Attorney General Janet Reno started the first collaborative courts in the nation because she saw that criminal justice was failing. And what she did is she set up a court utilizing positive reinforcement, but also very strict accountability, and she brought everyone to the table. You see, the big problem with criminal justice is that mindset that people are going to fail. And in the collaborative courts, what we do is we gather everyone to the table. So it's the judge, the prosecutor, the defense lawyer, the probation officer, the treatment therapist, and everybody else. And the questions we ask are not when is this person going to fail, but we ask, is this person mentally ill? Is this person homeless? Does this person suffer from substance abuse? Is this person a combat veteran? And what can we, working together, craft individually for this human being to help them succeed? And succeed they have. 80% of our clients in collaborative justice graduate from our program in the last 18 years. And of that 80%, the majority of them have never picked up another criminal case. Not only that, for every dollar we spend in collaborative courts, we save seven to ten dollars in incarceration costs alone. So these courts save lives, save money, and make our community safer. So why aren't the legislators all over this evidence-based practice? I guess, I think, it's because we don't have the funds to pay for lobbyists or campaign contributions. We can't compete with the prison lobby that's so richly funded. In our state, the state of California, in the year 2010, we spent $7.9 billion incarcerating people. $7.9 billion. And what did we get for our money? There wasn't a reduction in crime. Our neighborhoods aren't safer. And those inmates are returned to their communities with little or no rehabilitation. There was a massive study in the year 2006 of all inmates housed in jails and prisons in the United States. That study found that more than half of them suffer from some form of mental illness. That's 1,250,000 human beings. To put that in perspective, the largest de facto mental institution in our nation is the Los Angeles County Jail. Who benefits from our approach to criminal justice other than the prison lobby? Isn't it time that we admitted that this approach of jails and prisons as some kind of retribution or half-hearted attempt to rehabilitate is a failed social experiment and certainly not an evidence-based response to crime. And furthermore, from a humanitarian perspective, what does this say about us as a country? Republican Governor Chris Christie recently signed a bill. This was a law mandating drug court in his state. And when he signed that bill, he said, no human life is dis dispensable. He said drug courts are a common sense, fiscal and moral response to assisting addicted individuals turn their lives around without warehousing them in prison. Chris Christie, I never thought I'd agree with him on anything let alone see him as a beacon of hope for future change. I will know that we're really on track when the mentally ill receive these same opportunities. Because isn't it time that we began to look at mental illness 
as a disease instead of a crime and treat them with medications and lifestyle changes in the same way that we successfully treat diabetes and heart disease? In the 20 years that I've been on the bench, I have come to believe that if we gather together and collaborate, our success is always going to be greater. And the wonderful thing is, no matter what your occupation is, if you treat yourself and others with compassion, dignity, and respect, the outcome will always be better. I hope, it is my wish, that someday we will have less prisons, and someday the mentally ill will be treated with dignity and respect. And I believe that this will happen because we will gather together and harness the power of our beautiful minds to resolve these problems. Thank you.